Hello and welcome back to Nibble Pop. In this class, we will be taking up T.S. Eliot's Preludes. Now, there are hundreds of videos on this poem which begin with a very detailed biography of T.S. Eliot as well as of modern poetry. I'm not going into those things. I have complete faith in Eliot that this poem itself will make you understand what modern poetry is and what Eliot is going to write throughout his life after this is published. Now, the Preludes is actually a combination of four poems, which Eliot wrote when he was in early 20s and around 1910 to 12 that phase it was published with proof rock in 1917 and then in 1922 comes the most important poem the wasteland which uh, you will be reading when you will be going for your masters preludes literally means introduction it was specifically used in context of music. You know, when you start a musical program, you fine tune your instruments and you play a test run. That is technically called a prelude. This is Eliot's test run. In this poem, he is going to tell us about what he thinks about poetry, what he thinks about life in general, and what we are to expect from him. In your syllabus, you also have proof rock. And once you get to know Eliot through preludes, it will be far easier for you to understand what he's talking about in proof rock. Therefore, without any background information, let's just approach the text. And maybe then we can talk about the background, the themes, the motives, the symbols, uh, which are relevant to this poem in particular okay so stay with me till the end of this lecture because i'm sure once you listen to what i have to say this poem will be far easier to tackle all right so if you haven't still subscribed to this channel do subscribe so that you get notified about any new lectures which i give or any new videos which i make um, so let's just begin with the text. Preludes, as I have already said, is an introduction. It's like a preface to something greater that is about to come. Remember what I talked about uh, invocation when I was teaching Paradise Lost? It is very similar to that. It kind of states the purpose of a poet's life. It's going to state uh, the purpose of what he is about to give us through his writings okay look at the four stanzas as four individual poems and then as a combination which Eliot wants us to make a connection which Eliot wants us to make that all these are so very connected. All these are individual preludes to his understanding of the world. Now, how does preludes begin? Let's look at the first prelude. The winter evening settles down with smell of steaks and passageways, six o'clock, the burnt out ends of smoky days, and now a gusty shower wraps the grimy scraps of withered leaves about your feet and newspapers from vacant lots. The showers beat on broken blinds and chimney pots and at the corner of the street a lonely cab horse steams and stamps and then the lighting of the lamps. This is so different from the kind of poems that you have read till now. It is so different from uh, Shelley's uh, West Wind or Wordsworth's uh, poems which you have had in your syllabus, even from Coleridge's uh, Kubla Khan. There you have 
a certain narrative there you have a certain voice speaking to you here that is so absent who is speaking to you who is giving an introduction to you you don't see the eyes behind the lens it is as if a cinematographer or a photographer is taking on pictures okay so there is the cinematic description of a cityscape now in our discussion of victorian poetry we had talked about the transition in uh, the minds of londoners in the minds of english english people this transition is reflected in a greater way when we are reading preludes look at the timeline of eliot he is writing this just when the world was was on the verge of the most devastating thing it had ever seen in its history the first world war okay so 1910 1912 that part you know it is approaching a catastrophe on the other hand so far as eliot is concerned eliot was born in america and he went on to study in harvard and therefore uh, you can call him an american poet as well as a british poet now london in 1912 1910 was a city that was affluent you know people were uh, flocking towards london people were uh, ambitiously encouraging uh, the the modernization of the world and at the same time there was this massive uh, exodus massive transition from the pastoral life from the village life from the rustic life okay so the emergence of an industrialized as well as a metropolitan life this made man so much away from that benevolent presence of nature which sustained the romantics this transition this alienation of man from that rejuvenating force is reflected in the images of city life which eliot is giving you in the first prelude itself and let's look at the images one by one the winter evening settles down with smell of steaks in passageways now evening is a very favorite uh, setting for eliot in proof rock we also see evening as the starting point you know in the evening lays out itself like a patient it rises uh, on a table therefore this evening uh, which is you know which is which carries in it the uh, the elements of decay of of something uh, you know dying off like autumn is different from the evening or the autumn which we see in the works of romantic poets uh, there is uh, no hope or optimism uh, which we found in case of shelley you know winter comes can spring be far behind and uh, in keats we have uh, when he says in autumn uh, that autumn has its music too that optimism that uh, resilience that feeling of confidence is something which we don't find here because the winter evening which eliot is writing about is going to have a hangover what kind of an hangover a hangover is something uh, you have is headache and fatigue and feeling of being extremely tired uh, if you spend the evening drinking it is as if the whole civilization the urban civilization is senselessly wasting away in intoxication in misery and is going to wake up in a hangover no optimism there 
and certainly no hope here. The winter evening settles down with smell of sticks in passageways. So for setting, Iliad is not choosing, uh, you know, wide landscapes and beautiful lake district. He is choosing the alleys, the dark places of London where uh, you find the flavors of London which is not glamorized at all. And they are not just flavors of London. They are the stench of city life which is so universal. Okay. Six o'clock. Now, in the first two lines, you have a very regularized rhythm, an iambic rhythm. You know, uh, if you read it, it will be like the winter evening settles down with smell of sticks and passageways. It is as if Eliot is inviting you into a regular rhythm uh, where you begin to expect a conventionality. And then in the third line, he breaks. He says six o'clock and six o'clock is a moment of transition when the evening settles down. Okay and he is giving you a very short stop there. It is as if to jerk you out of your nonchalance or your indifference. You know he will stop you midway with a break of rhyme and break of rhythm. The burnt out ends of smoky days and now a gusty shower wraps the grimy scraps. The burnt out end of smoky days, it is like a metaphor of a cigarette or a cigar where after the intoxication is over, all you are left with is a burnt out end. So it is as if when man is passing his days, then he is ending up in the same monotony, in the same wastefulness as a cigarette end. Okay. So, and plus he also refers to the pollution, the actual literal pollution of London. And now a gusty shower wraps the grimy scraps you know the grimy scraps means the tidbits all lying around uh, the pollutants the waste which are littering all about and the shower which is again uh, usually a poetic symbol of rejuvenation of beauty of grace of happiness becomes an agent of turning things even messier so the shower does not purify, the water does not purify, it makes things worse, muddier. All right. So here you are repeatedly uh, given images which are taken out of their traditional poetic significance. You are having a new look at the words, at the images which have been used traditionally in a different way, way by uh, other poets, conventional poets or previous poets. The grimy scraps of withered leaves about your feet and newspapers from vacant lots, the showers beat on broken blinds and chimney pots. Look at the objects he is referring to here, withered leaves. Uh, because it's winter and the fall is over so leaves are scattered all about the streets and his description of the streets is replete with images of withered and vacant and muddy objects okay the showers beat on broken blinds and chimney pots. Blinds are uh, special kinds of windows okay, uh, which have uh, these small slits through which you can peep. Okay, That is a blind. And these blinds are also broken. So I would ask you to look at this first stanza and identify the adjectives. Those adjectives will help you understand what this whole thing is about. 
So what are the adjectives he is using here? Smoky, grimy, withered, vacant, broken. So all these adjectives, they all create an atmosphere of loss, an atmosphere of boredom, sordidness, wasted feeling of uh, being alive but not alive. So that is the kind of impression which Iliad wants to project through the first stanza. And at the corner of the street, a lonely cab horse steams and stamps and then the lighting of the lamps. So on one hand, you hardly have any human figure in the first stanza except uh, the part about feet. So the feet is the only word which he uses uh, which refer to a human body. Otherwise, there is absolute absence of any human being. The only living creature he mentions is the horse. It is as if he is dehumanizing the whole scene or rather he is presenting you a scene which is dehumanized. And what is the horse doing? The horse is not, you know, racing through a wide expanse of greenery. The horse is stamping its feet, it's impatient. And it is not given the opportunity to explore its full potential. So the horse becomes not just the animated figure, the only animated figure in the paragraph, in the stanza, but it also becomes a metaphor of impatience. And now I will bring you to the last line of the first preludes and then the lighting of the lamps. Now during the evening time, uh, the street lamps were uh, lit up one by one. Uh, those were usually uh, gas lights and they gave out a very fumy, smoky kind of light. It is almost similar to what, you know, Milton uh, said in his description of hell. It's very infernal, like the darkness visible, which serves only to illuminate suffering. Okay. Regions of sorrow, doleful shade, remember from your study of Paradise Lost. So those spots of inferno which Milton brought through that expression, darkness visible, is something which haunts us when we read this. Again, why I'm uh, talking about Milton when I'm talking about Iliad? Because Iliad failed that uh, no poet, no writer wrote alone. When he writes or when she writes, it is as if an entire body, an entire history writes with him. This is the tradition of poetry where any new poet participates. He might have his individuality, he might, might have his individual talent, but he is never completely, you know, broken from his past. So when Eliot is writing, Milton is writing. When Eliot is writing, Shakespeare is writing. When Eliot is writing, definitely Dante is writing. And in our understanding of prelude, it is no mistake. It is not a crime. If you remember moments of literary history, seeping through these images. Okay. Therefore, what the first stanza is about? The first stanza is about a scene in London or rather a collection of images on a London street and all the images are sordid, are non-vital and they give out a sense of frustration. Here, I want you to remember one phrase which, which uh, Eliot coined and that phrase is objective correlative. 
what is objective correlative in very simple terms uh, although he used it in context of uh, his uh, criticism of hamlet as an artistic failure but the basic idea is a poet a writer need not give you his emotions on a plate served on a platter he will give you objects and those objects or those you know objective information that will have its adequate emotional response in you for example when you hear the expression burnt out end of smoky days you don't feel joyful you feel the frustration uh, and and the sense of wastefulness when you look at that image when you think about that image a horse stamping at the corner of a street do you feel uh, feel it feel very uh, very uplifted by that image you don't which means that these images are creating in you an emotional response which is basically the subject of this poem these objects are not the subject of this poem the subject of this poem is that emotion that response which it generates in the readers okay. coming to the second preludes while the first preludes talk about a street of london in the evening let us look at the second prelude the morning comes to consciousness of faint stale smells of beer so while we still had some expectation that the evening was stale the evening was sordid maybe when uh, morning comes the sun comes up things will be uh, more joyful and uh, maybe the poet will talk in a different manner but no because see i told you about that hangover and that hangover is worse the next day okay the morning comes to consciousness on one side it feels as if consciousness is associated with awareness uh, with rejuvenation okay it's like a rebirth we all know that uh, when we wake up uh, from our sleep it's like we are getting a new life but here that happiness that joy is denied the morning comes to consciousness but with that idea with that memory of a sordid evening so it carries on to the next morning from the sordid trampled street with all its muddy feet that press to early coffee stands and what do people do in the morning in city lives they flock towards their workplaces their schools their colleges their offices their banks and this is such a monotony of routine that you are no longer a human being going for your work you are a feet trampling on the street you are a hand which picks up a coffee mug and you have lost your human elements because how is a human being a human being because of the consciousness of being a man because of the presence of this idea of humanity and what makes a man or a woman human is assertion of agency you know agency is what i want to do something as an agent i am making a decision i am making a choice that makes you human but when in the morning you get up you have no choice but to go to your workplace you have no choice but to you know, buy coffee from the same vendor and uh, get newspaper as a habit uh, smoke on a pipe as a habit you are a creature of habit and you no longer deserve to be called a whole human being so you end up being only feet and hand and nothing more than that so from the sordid trampled street with all its muddy feet that press to early coffee stands now because it's uh, it rained in the previous evening therefore the sordid 
was sprinkled on the streets uh, to to hide that mud it's like a temporary measure it is as if similar it is as if similar to the temporary measures we take to you know, cover up the mud the griminess the dirt which our lives contain but these are so temporary measures because you see when you sprinkle sawdust on a street and the next day people start walking on that again it becomes even muddier so instead of cleaning up your consciousness when you cover it up temporarily with the sawdust all you end up with is even a worse situation so this is what the street has become with the other masquerades the time resumes one thinks of all the hands that are raising dingy shades in a thousand furnished rooms this is the central idea in iliad which he developed so beautifully in his later poetry the idea of masquerade it is like we do not want to express freely anymore we do not want to show people who we are or rather we assume multiple personalities and this is so relevant even in today's context you open somebody's facebook profile you see that the person is so happy in their domestic life and then you see 2 uh, 3 uh, years later uh, that that marriage didn't even work you open a person's profile on tinder and you see that that person is looking for a girlfriend and later on you find out that a person is married with two kids so why do we do this why do we assume these identities and even when we are not lying blatantly about ourselves do we actually tell people how we are feeling about things no it's not even about bravery and cowardice it's about the fact that we feel vulnerable we feel that if we let people see who we are we will be hurt and then there is this sense of competition that uh, you know she is uh, doing this so let me just do even better at least show that i can do it better so life has become only a rat race and this is what iliad was writing in 1910 and it is so relevant even in 2020 this concept of masquerade so now i'm going to uh, take from uh, iliad's later poetry reference to this masquerade uh, if you look at the hollow men this trope of masquerade continues you know i'm reading from the hollow men let me also wear such deliberate disguises disguise means when you hide yourself deliberate means when you choose to do that on your own when you want to do it consciously so disguises are deliberate all right humans uh, become their own shadows when you wear a mask you impersonate somebody else and at the same time a part of yourself remains stuck in that mask okay in wasteland and this in wasteland iliad writes so beautifully about this whole concept of masquerade uh, when he says i will show you something different from either your shadow at morning striding behind you or your shadow at evening rising to meet you so we have our shadows one shadow for the morning one shadow for the evening and those are different from our bodies our individualities human beings are seen as just a collection of organs and scattered fragmented organs you notice the word hands raising shades now when you lift up a shade usually light floods in but what it is revealed it reveals not a home but a thousand furnished houses so what you see 
is no more the hearth or the core of somebody's life but just another setting where now we take selfies to show people that we are in a beautiful setting we are so obsessed with how people see us that we end up showing them something which we are definitely not this hypocrisy this fragmentation is the curse of a metropolitan life is the curse of an urban life which in the pre world war period iliad identifies the third part of preludes is perhaps the most ingenious one okay now i'll just take you through that you tossed a blanket from the bed you lay upon your back and waited you dozed and watched the night revealing the thousand sordid images of which your soul was constituted they flickered against the ceiling and when all the world came back and the light crept up between the shutters and you heard the sparrows in the gutters you had such a vision of the street as the street hardly understands sitting along the bed's edge where you curled the papers from your hair or clasped the yellow soles of feet in the palms of both soiled hands who is you is it the reader whom he later is directly talking to or is it somebody else now going through milton's own notes we'll know that he is definitely talking about a prostitute and when she wakes up in the morning with the memory of the last night's burden her way of looking at life her way of understanding things is highlighted here ironically in stanza 1 and 2 you don't have any complete human figure you have office goers feet you have hands lifting up windows you have feet trampling the street so you have fragmented bodies in the third stanza you can find a complete human being lying on the bed and what is this person doing you tossed a blanket from the bed you lay upon your back and waited so this waiting is very significant here what is she waiting for the morning has come and it has brought no respite no rest for her this brings us to the concept of uh, waiting for something which will never come which later develops in beckets waiting for go to so this this concept of feeling frustrated yet this urge to carry on because you are waiting for something to happen is seen in this image of this prostitute because she you know that the last evening was a sordid evening today's evening is going to be equally sordid evening but despite this reputation she is waiting you dozed and watched the night revealing the thousand sordid images of which your soul was constituted so she was lying back and the images from the previous evening previous night projected on her imaginary canvas as if she was looking at those images and trying to figure out the meaning of it all the meaning of or the purpose of her existence so while in the first two stanzas we do not have any human being interpreting anything here you have an interpreter of experience a very sordid experience a very low life experience but she is an interpreter they flickered against the ceiling and when all the world came back and the light crept up between the shutters when morning is is finally there when she is supposed to feel very happy and rejuvenated because night is over and it's a new day what does she hear you heard the sparrows in the gutters sparrows so there are no nightingales or larks anymore sparrows are very urban birds 
and the moment Eliot is mentioning sparrows in the gutters, he is taking away again all those preconceived ideas which have formed for so many years in the minds of the readers. He is presenting you with an image, dissociating it from what you think about that image and giving you a different meaning to it in a new light altogether. Okay. You had such a vision of the street as the street hardly understands. A street is a non-living thing. Here, even if you consider the street to be uh, a metaphor of uh, people on the street, even then uh, you will see that Eliot is placing that woman or that woman's understanding of the world on a higher level than the people who are assuming masquerades. That woman doesn't need a masquerade. That woman doesn't need to cover her identity. The world has rejected her. She is a low woman and she doesn't have to hide herself. In Eliot's poetry, you have this constant crossing over, you know, you talk about a human being and then you talk about the street. You talk about the experience of what is happening inside the home and then he brings you straight to the gutters, to the chimney pots. And it's like he is not allowing you to stay in a place and feel secure. Now in my other videos, I'm usually bothered by traffic sounds and you know the bike uh, swishing past my house, uh, people uh, chittering about. But in this video, I'm feeling less bothered. Somehow I feel this gives me the appropriate backdrop to understand what Eliot is trying to tell you. That this world is not a soundproof room where you can record uninterrupted. This is a real place where you have no consolation of any idyllic land or any utopia. This is dystopia. This is the experience of a city life which gives man no scope of going beyond this boundary. Right. And this is what that prostitute understands, that woman understands, because this is what makes her superior in Eliot's eyes. So the street doesn't understand the futility of its existence. She understands and in her understanding she is superior. You curl the papers from your hair or clasp the yellow soles of feet in the palms of both soiled hands yellow souls of feet, you know, feet of people uh, from the working class, people who do not have a pampered way of life. So he is talking about the newly uh, formed lower middle class, working class society and at the same time extends that to include the whole of urban civilization. So this one image, yellow souls, that gives you the sense of wastedness, the sense of decay, degeneration. Yellow, which is usually a very bright color. And when poets use yellow, they use it to, uh, to communicate images of vitality. You know, the sun is yellow, golden yellow. You know, a host of golden daffodils. Remember those yellow images of beauty. So Iliad is taking that word and he is making a new meaning out of it. So in the third stanza or rather in the third preludes we have the image of a woman who is aware of the limitations of her life, who is aware of the futility of the cyclic patterns of routine which the street people are not aware of. They revel in it. They think that it is their ambition which is driving them. But it is mere routine. It is mere laziness you know, which, which stops them from doing something which they really want to do. Fourth preludes again brings us back to the street. The first preludes was about the street. 
the fourth preludes is also about the street his soul stretched tight across the skies obviously it's about the street but at the same time this whole image of somebody's soul stretching out into eternity has almost christ like implications now eliot later on in his life uh, towards 1930s he turned into an anglicist and uh, he even wrote religious poems after that but here he is questioning the connection between that one greater man which milton writes about and humanity in general so it is as if human beings are trampling on that belief system trampling on that street which is stretching out all right or trampled by insistent feet at 4 and 5 and 6 o'clock so look at the repetition of time and this creates an element of regularized monotony 4 and 5 and 6 o'clock okay like human beings are working like a clockwork mouse and uh, going about the same business without understanding why they are doing it and what are human beings doing in uh, at 4 and 5 and 6 o'clock and short square fingers stuffing pipes you know uh, putting tobacco inside pipes and they're going to smoke an evening newspaper so we have a return to the first stanza through the images so here also he talks about people smoking buying newspaper right so it is as if he is bringing his poem to a full circle in the same way that urban man or urban woman goes through the monotony of their lives it all comes to a full circle and short square fingers stuffing pipes and evening newspapers and eyes so you have another body part here the eyes assured of certain certainties i'm going to get up in the morning i'm going to catch the bus i'm going to go to my college then i'm going to go to tuition then i'm going to go to my friend's house come back you are certain that when you get up in the morning that i'm going to do these things throughout the day somebody thinks that i'm going to get up go to the bank get some money uh, buy a ticket to hawaii i'll go there with uh, the person i love and i'll spend a lovely vacation there so these are all illusions of certainty are you certain that you are going to survive the day are you certain you are going to survive the the flight to hawaii no but that is what makes us go on through this monotony of life and this monotony gives us a certainty assures us that okay yesterday i went to my office these this these things happened so today in the morning i'll go in the same manner therefore things will happen in the same manner in the evening too so in that way this routine is giving us an assurance of continuity while we are working in this clockwork fashion what we stop understanding is that this continuity is taking away from us eternity this continuity is taking away from us our greatness unless you break that routine unless you do something uncertain your whole existence becomes fragmented feet hands and eyes right the conscience of a blackened street impatient to assume the world the while on one hand we have people assured of certainties people who know what they want from life and they think they know what they want from life and on the other hand that street is getting impatient because that street has suffered through all these masquerades through all this trampling and you can equate this impatience with the impatience of the horse in the first stanza so this is how he comes back to the first part of the poem okay i am moved by fancies that are curled around these images 
and cling the notion of some infinitely gentle, infinitely suffering thing. I, the first person pronoun, brings us to the poet, finally. This is what the poet tells us about himself. And what does he say? He says that these images are like his access to understand what is wrong with the world. These images are offered to him. He looks at these images, you know, people walking, collecting newspaper, horse stamping, uh, that woman waking up in a sordid mood. And all these images, this, this evening light, this gloominess, they trigger in him a conclusion. And what does he conclude? He has this image of this is fancy of uh, this infinitely gentle and suffering thing. Who was the, the epitome of suffering and gentleness? Jesus. So here we have a direct allusion, a direct connection to this Christian concept of redemption offered by the gentleness, offered by the kindness of Christ. But here he is questioning, he is using the word notion. Notion is a very um, less imaginative word. Notion is something which you gather from logic and sometimes a logic. But notion has a duality of meaning. It can be either true or false, nobody knows. And fancy is something which definitely doesn't depend on logic. It is something which depends on imagination. So all these images which he talks about creates in Eliot an impression that there is a super consciousness which is reflected in very few people and the super consciousness is suffering. So this is what this whole poem is about. Wipe your hand across your mouth and laugh. When do we wipe our mouth across and laugh? When we are nervous, when we are self-conscious, uh, when we think that uh, I'm not uh, going to look at these images because I feel uncomfortable. So he's saying that I don't know how you're going to react to my poem. I don't know how you're going to react to these images. You can simply ignore what I'm trying to say. You can simply wipe out your mouth and laugh and he is not bothered much about our reactions because he knows that even in today's reality, we are only reenacting the rituals that have been going on for ages. The last lines are simply very fascinating. The worlds revolve like ancient women gathering fuel in vacant lots. So remember the vacant lots where the newspapers, he talks about newspapers in vacant lots. So how is the world turning? The world is following the same cyclic pattern it followed earlier. So women gathering fuel for their houses uh, to nurture, to light a fire for cooking, for warmth for their families. So this urge to have a meaningful life is content in that image of gathering fuel. You gather fuel for sustenance. But where are these women gathering fuel now? They are gathering fuel in vacant lots. They are no more, uh, they don't have this free access to uh, resources of nature anymore. This means that we have a city life to lead. We have an urban existence to suffer through. But we have no option but to gather sustenance from that. To go on in the same cyclic pattern that has been going on since ages. And uh, when he talks about ancient women gathering fuel, he definitely triggers an image of uh, the, the sisters of faith, you know, were kind of writing the history of humanity. So on one hand, we have 
images bombarding on the reader's mindscape. And on the other hand, he is talking about the condensed one single image of a cyclic pattern. So what is the preludes all about? Preludes is an introduction to Iliad's idea of what poetry should be. Poetry should not be uh, what he criticized was worth to be saying about poetry that it's a spontaneous outflow of powerful feelings. It's not that. You don't give out your feelings. You give out the images. The images will speak for themselves. Many of the students uh, are afraid to approach modern poetry. Many people say that modern poetry is difficult to understand. But what I personally think is that modern poetry is easiest to approach because it talks about a life or a pattern of living which you know about because you don't know about uh, how people thought and believed in and what people did uh, during the time when Beowulf uh, was uh, written or when Chaucer was writing. You are given information about those ages by books or authors of historians. But you know what modern life is. You know what urban life is. So here the poet doesn't need an interpreter to reach out to you. Yes, you need to understand that in some or in most modern poems, uh, you have references, uh, very, very uh, condensed images. But still, they are images of a life which you identify with. Iliad's Preludes is not just about Iliad's understanding of poetry only. It is also about how the modern poets looked at the genre of poetry. I hope today's discussion will prepare you to have a better understanding and appreciation of uh, the love song of G. Alfred Ruffrock, which we will be taking up next. And I believe after we complete Proofrock, again I'll be simply going through the poem with you, reading through the poem with you. I believe then you will have some conclusive idea already formed in your mind about what to expect from modern poetry or from modern poets. Maybe in uh, future I will be making a consolidated video on modernism or modern poetry or maybe on Iliad separately. But I think that understanding preludes just as a poem, even without understanding anything about Iliad's background or background of modern age, understanding preludes is the right way to start understanding Iliad. This is what Iliad wanted. He wanted us to know about him through these images which he is spreading out before you on a platter. If you need any written material, you can go to the link given in the description box and uh, you can ask me any question you like concerning Iliad, concerning this poem or, in, in, or any other poem that you want me to explain to you. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed today's class. And I hope to see you all very soon again. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.